Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you about Olympic lifting and football. As you see here, this is Isaac Frithy. He was one of my best friends. We kind of graduated together. He was a year behind me in school, but we were the same age. And this is, do you guys know who this other guy is? Never seen him before? Dmitry Polkov. He's probably one of the best Olympic lifters right now in the world. So just kind of see the triple joint extension. We'll go over more of that later. A little about me, I have an associate's degree in criminal justice, I have a bachelor's degree in Winona State in exercise science. I competed in um, four national weightlifting meets, took second, uh, third, sixth, and ninth over the past, uh, I've been lifting now for 14 years, since 2001 when we started at that clinic. Um, I was a starter on a 2007-2008 state football team. Uh, I held the held most sacks in Minnesota in 2008. <coughs> I was only 150 pounds and 5'10". So you can see that Olympic lifts, I wasn't huge, but I was very powerful. And we'll go over more about the difference between strength and power. And then, I've been coaching <coughs> now at Calhoun for five years, ever since I graduated. I've coached five athletes at Weightlifting Nationals. A couple of them have taken first, a couple of them have taken <coughs> second and third. Um, I'm currently running a gym in Calhoun, and I've worked with many D1 and D2 athletes. I currently work with a lot of D2 athletes at Winona State right now. A little history about us since 2007. And uh, we won five state chat, uh, titles in the past nine years. And I've uh, had many individuals uh, win state titles in Olympic weightlifting and wrestling. Boys basketball made it to state in 2014, so this, this past year. It was the first time they've been there in 15 years. And we've been struggling with other sports. I work with all sports. I program for all the sports that we have. And the, it's been, football was obviously, that was a no-brainer. Then we've been working with other sports. Basketball and wrestling are a couple other ones I've been kind of struggling with since I've been started. And recently, in the past two years now, we've been doing Olympic lifts with our football players and all the other sports. And now they've seen results, won in 2014, took third in state. Girls basketball, won state in 2009. They've been doing Olympic lifts before then. Girls volleyball took second in state in 2012. I believe that was our st first state appearance and our first uh, state uh, at the championship. Track team won state in 2012. And we have two Navy SEALs right now that have graduated from our football program. One was Trent Antlovic. He's been there. He's put his 20 years in. It was back. He was working in his garage in the BSF system. And we have one right now, Zach Graham. He has actually just graduated from the Navy SEALs. So he is actually serving our country right now. And obviously, I don't know if you guys know this, but Carl Blue, he was on the 2000 State football team. He was at uh, Tennessee Titans. And he was like one of our first introduction of uh, when we did Olympic lift lifting and incorporated the football. So that's just our little history about it. And you see Brent there jump up, so he does lifting too. <coughs> yeah. Why do we use weightlifting with our athletes? So you guys, I assume, uh, Wisconsin does a lot of BSF systems. <coughs> Minnesota is totally opposite. It's huge in Olympic weightlifting. We have over 300 athletes that compete in Olympic weightlifting. So that's a snatch and clean and jerk. Why we use weightlifting with our athletes? To increase power production. I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, we use the full Olympic lifts, variations of those lifts, with different athletes to become faster, stronger, and more powerful. To increase speed, with that, we have our speed program too that will kind of Elaborate on a little bit. Now, increase our vertical jump. As you see, I'll show you a video, video and I'll uh, explain the triple joint extension. To increase power, to increase bone uh, mineral density. A little snippet on that. I was in my nutrition class, and um, we had a bone density on our feet. And this was, I've been lifting for 10 years now. And they stuck it in there, and I wouldn't read it, I wouldn't read it. And she's like, that must be wrong. But the machine only can read up so high on your bone density, and I was above that. So that's, it couldn't even read me because I had such dense bone from Olympic lifting. Uh, improves overall health, so resting heart rate, you know, just uh, normal stuff. Improves flexibility, balance, coordination, athleticism. So you have to catch that weight overhead, so you got to receive that load, okay? You got to be pretty athletic to receive that load. If you think in powerlifting, you got to squat and back up. Clean, boom, <coughs> you got to catch it quick, you got to receive that load, you know, take a hit. And I'll explain that a little bit too. So today, what's, okay, what's the difference? What's strength, what's power? Strength and force, so strength, and all this stuff I got from is USA Weightlifting. I'm a level two national coach there. So a lot of the stuff I got from there, I expect when I went to Colorado Springs and took the course. So this is a lot of the stuff I got from them and from a couple other coaches I know. 
So the strength is the ability of muscle to contract and exert force. Okay? What is force? Effect on one has upon another. So force is inversely the proportion to the speed in which fibers shorten. Concentric contraction. So will you tell me what does that mean? I'm going to get kind of technical, but then I'll go back to practical. So if you guys kind of understand here. This means the heavier the weight to be lifted, the greater the amount of force and the slower the fibers contract. So yeah, you're going to get strong with that heavy load over your head, but you're not going to be quick. Likewise, the lighter the weight, the less force, so it'll be faster fibers. Okay? That's a little bit of strength and force. So power. What does power mean in athletic <coughs> performance? The ability to apply force through a full range of motion of a body, uh, body joint mo uh, movement with speed and the maximum time and distance. So apply force over maximum speed and distance. The capacity to be given the amount of work as rapidly as possible. So try to move this weight to over here as quick as you can, from the ground to up here. All right, speed is an uh, ability to apply force. So strength times speed equals power. So the quicker you move the weight, the more power you have. Powerful athletes are the ones who have the greatest impact on sports. And this is a little video that Scott Safe put to, I think, seven years ago now. I'll show you that. I'll be able to hear it. That's Scott Safe's son, up in Panda Falls. I think he's working right now with the UMD. He's won many national championships, played football for many years. That's his son, that's his son Corey. He's working at CrossFit. As I took the run extension that we're going to talk about, in this case, they kind of pointed out in the video. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but I'll kind of talk to you. There's a hip, knee, ankle, the triple joint extension where that produces the most power with that. That's what we're trying to build. This video is on YouTube, so you guys can go and watch it. I'll kind of show you exactly what it is. And you can hear more about what he's trying to talk about. We're basically saying that we're trying to develop our athletes from the weight room to the football by training the power of the triple joint extension. He can snatch, I think, 120 kilos. Kilos conversion is, you know, 100, uh, one kilo is 2.2 pounds. Let's look at this See how she just hit the triple joint? She hit the triple joint. We're trying to change that power so she increases the vertical jumps. You can pull it to this, this. Uh, a wide receiver catching the ball. Or a DN trying to jump up to hit the ball away from the quarterback. This is mirror not successfully There's a power production. And receiving that load, we'll talk about receiving it and then getting it hit in the football. Increase the vertical jump. Look at that power. We have right now on our basketball team, we have four guys that can dunk. And it's not just because of they're tall, but they can get way above the rim because of our Olympic weights that we do. Okay, so that's power. That's the difference between strength and power. I know some coaches kind of don't know what the difference is, but that's what strength is a slow movement of just brute you know, just that huge build. And uh, Olympic lifting is more of that, that power, and that's that quick motion with a lot of weight. Kind of just explain that a little bit. There's the difference, Olympic lifting versus power lifting. The snatch and clean and jerk are the main lifts, and obviously for power lifting, it's the bench, press, and deadlift are the main lifts. Olympic lifts increase power development, 
create fast athletic performance, develop the fast twitch fibers, if you guys know what that is. Uh, you basically have two different types of fibers, the slow twitch and fast twitch. I'm not going to go into that too much. And increase your speed, increase your vertical jump, increase your power. Bone mentor density, <coughs> I mean, strength training will do that too, or power lifting. Um, improves overall health, I kind of explained that, and increase flexibility and all that. The difference between the, a lot of coaches that don't understand, power lifting is not true power lifts, they're strength lifts. Olympic lifting is the power lifts. You'll increase strength with your power lifting, but you're not going to increase your power. It's a little easier to teach the, uh, uh, the power lifts than it is the Olympic lifts, so you have to kind of get certified and know what you're doing. I'll explain the best certification for that. So these are two guys, just to kind of lay out those statistics here. Doyle Kennedy is a renowned power lifter. I don't know if you guys know him. And then Alex Pisaronko. Pisaronko. So what he is, he is a huge Olympic lifter back in the day. So just point out some numbers here. Kennedy, 140 kilos. He lifted 405 deadlift. 0.4 meters at two seconds. Okay, kind of slow, not that very far. Pisaronko was 120 kilos. So a little lighter than he was. He only lifted about half his weight, 265 kilos, but he lift, lifted almost twice as much, twice as far. So you gotta pull that bar up to here. Basically your jump, your triple joint extension, was 0.9 meters. And he did it in 0.9 seconds, almost half the time lifting it twice as far. Or you say, well, it's lighter. Well, not necessarily. So to, to figure out all the, there's, you know, work and all that. So to figure out the watts is 793.8 watts he produced during that lift. <coughs> Pizzaroco did uh, 2,597 watts in that lift. So he did half the time produce almost three times as much watts. So it comes out to 21.64 watts per kilogram of body mass that he has, so he developed more power. And the other guy, Doyle, did 5.67 watts per kilogram of body mass. So you can see where the power development is there for your athlete. A little statistic. Okay, so what does all this mean? So if I train my athlete Olympic lifting, what is that, how does that correlate to football? So the, there's an explanation of it. So some examples of explosive power to reactive power. The football player getting out of his stance is that first pull on that clean, okay? That explosive power off of it. A uh, football player jumping to catch the ball is that second pull in that clean and that snatch. Uh, receiving a hit from a football player, so you say hit, receiving that hit, receiving that clean, you're going to receive a lot of load, okay? You're going to get hit. So that's going to, you know, train the body to receive a load, a heavy load. Probably more than whatever football player will be able to hit you. So the five physical qualities of weightlifting that help in development of athletes. So the speed strength, being quick. <coughs> As you know, our program is very quick. We're not huge. Um, um, I think our boys need to eat more. <laughs> but um, So that would develop the quick and speed, the explosive power. The flexibility and mobility. For an athlete to get here, to squat all the way down, that takes a lot of mobility and stability. You know, back squat, power lifting, you know, low bar versus high bar, depends upon what you do. That's not going to get a lot of mobility. And, um, you know, deadlift, you're only going from year to year. But front squat, you got to get down here. You got to have shoulder mobility. Okay, the FMS screen, I'm a level two FMS guy, I'm a functional movement guy. So what we do with some of our athletes, we haven't did a couple on a little, a little while, but we take them through a seven point screen and we find out their asymmetries versus, you know, from the light, left to right side, if their glutes are firing, all that. And I'll take them through different workouts to get that. And once they get the mobility down, I'll take them through the Olympic lifting um, strategy of how to do and what to do. It also develops kinesthetic awareness you guys don't know what that is, is where you are in relationship to other objects in space. For them to catch a weight overhead, they obviously got to know where that weight's going to be, okay? For them, running down the field, they got to know where that um, DB is, okay? But it's kinesthetic awareness, it really helps with it. And plus, our weight room, we have 50 athletes in there, six platforms. So there's a lot of stuff happening, bars flying overhead. You got to know where you are in relationship to other things in space, otherwise you're going to get hurt. General strength, so your relative strength, your power, or your um, strength. Hypertrophy and work capacity, your core strength and your stability. So you gotta have a great core to receive a load and to be able to upright. You're not gonna be able to bend over. 
okay? And your body composition and fitness. And you're pretty fit. So that's through this little snippet in there. What if I told you squatting doesn't hurt your knees? That's how you squat hurts your knees. So deep squat. Like here, oh, that's terrible for your knees. No, your knee is a hinge. It's not doing laterally anything when you're lifting. It's a hinge. It's not hurting your knee at all. It's your quad, your calf, and your hamstring are just doing all the lifts. You're, all your knee is doing is bending and coming back. You're not hurting anything. Weightlifting <coughs> produces far less injuries, hours of training, than any other competitive sport. If you see weightlifting as a sport, as it is at the bottom, so you have to go 168,551 hours before there's one injury. Football, 100 hours before there's one injury. As you see, soccer is 6.2. So you have 6.2 injuries per that 100 hours. That's the highest rate. US football is one. Uh, USA powerlifting is kind of low too. This is right above weightlifting. See, for that to be true, you gotta have a certified coach and know what you're talking about, and educate your other coaches and your athletes on what to do. If not, that could be really high. So a little, little programming that we do. Here's three that I thought of off the top of my head. There's many more programming out there. And I, the best programming is what you can do, incorporate with your athletes, and what your sport coaches or your football coach will want you to do to increase. So I talked to Jeff Renardi uh, recently. He's a strength coach at Winona State. He was down in Iowa State, and his, football, or his basketball coach came up to him and says, we want the biggest uh, benchers in the Big Ten. And Jeff's like, yeah, I can do that, but that's not going to really matter about anything with basketball. The coach is like, I don't care. I want the biggest benchers in the Big Ten. So he's like, all right, we'll do it. But he didn't, the other coach didn't care what else he did. So he did Olympic lifts and all that, and he was a huge bench press, and they got the athletes there. So it depends upon what your sport coaches want, what you want to achieve for you to have the correct programming. The one I know the most about is super compensation. I can go in a little bit about that. Try basics, it's Cal Beats, this baby. Um, I don't know much about it, but I think it's in, pretty impractical for a high school coach to incorporate Try Basic and get it right. And there's a small off, I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. The squat routine, it's huge volume, huge weight. Sometimes I'll do this with, um, right now we did it with someone on a state, uh, Linemen, and they're squatting on way up. This is over a summer, just during the strength phase of the programming. So there's strength phase, power phase, there's many other phases that you can go into. So super compensation kind of goes over, you want sports performance or you want competitive weightlifting. There's two different types. So there's cycle one, hypertrophy training, so getting bigger and increasing your strength and your power at the same time. So that's off season. And then you're gonna go to cycle two, which is strength and power training. And that's preseason, so right before season, and then you get in season. Okay, it's developing 12 week program. Right now it just shows four weeks, but cycle one is four weeks, cycle two is four weeks, cycle three is four weeks. So that averages out to 12. And there's just percentages there that kind of go up. So it's going to go base, load, recovery, or super compensation, and then peak. Okay, as you see, the percentage 70, 75, 65, 80. So there's been a lot of studies shown, uh, Scott Safe was out at, when he did his level two many, many years ago. Um, there's two coaches out there, I can't remember the top of their names, but they were in front. So their course, their third day, their course was, they had to argue their comp, you know, the topic super compensation, that's the right when it was first coming out. One coach believed that a little bit more volume was better than what he did. They both had the same results, but one always you know, they're both PhD doctors and they're arguing about who's smarter, basically. One did a little bit more volume, so like, instead of 70%, you do 75%. And it can be almost too much for high school athletes, for football, because you gotta take into consideration that they're taking a big hit out on the football field, and then they still gotta train, you know, in and off season. So you gotta, you gotta take that into consideration. And my, my thought, there's never overtraining, there's always under recovery. Okay, with my program. So we incorporate a lot of recovery. If a guy comes in sluggish, he's just really dicking the dog, I'll tell him to go out, do some mobility stuff, we'll work on that, relax for this week or relax for a couple days and then we'll hit it hard again. Because if you train him during that sluggish phase, he's never gonna get, he's gonna get overtrained. So we always incorporate a lot of recovery in that. Um, putting it to practical use, so you're like, 
All right, now what do I do? I got all this information. Olympic lifting's good. Powerlifting, I, I didn't say powerlifting's bad. Powerlifting is good to develop strength. Olympic lifting is better for athletic performance. It increases your power. So the first thing you should do is educate your coaches and athletes on weightlifting. So for you to educate them, you gotta get educated. So how do I do that? To get certified, USA Level 1. Go to um, usaweightlifting.org and it has multiple, multiple courses. And I've been assisting at one for the past four years now with Scott Save. I might be teaching some soon at different colleges about uh, the level one. And basically it is, you get the information about weightlifting and they incorporate sports performance in it. And you go in the weight room and we teach each other how to lift, the lift. So when you come in on morning on uh, Monday, you know what to do with your athletes. You'll be able to teach them the snatch. You'll be able to teach them the clean and jerk. You have the breakdown of what to do and when to do it and the mobility, the assessments and all that. We'll go over that. And then we'll go over that in the weight room. We'll teach you how to teach people. And then what, that third day or the second day at the end, you'll come in, you'll partner up and you'll teach them how to live. So it's actually very, very practical and it has a little bit of programming in there to help understand that. It's a great course. It's $495. There's one every year at UWL. We just had one this, actually this January. No, this, December. I can't remember. And then develop a practical programming from that. So you'll learn how to teach it, develop a program from that, and then, then to implement. Teach your athletes correct form. Develop time during practice. Yes. Take time out of football <laughs> practice to get your athletes in the weight room. Or some of us who right now we did speed in the morning, lifting during practice. We take practice time to lift. It's nuts. But we do, we take about 30 minutes, so the kids get out of school at 3, 3.05. They get in the weight room after speed warm up about 3.30. We have about half hour with them in the weight room. We have a system going. We get about 50 lifters in and out, and they get back out on the football field by four o'clock. So they have an hour and a half, almost two hours out on the football field. So, yes, lifting during practice. Because if you don't do that, if you say, hey, come and lift after practice. After practice, they're sluggish, they're dead, they're not gonna lift. And also, you have the younger kids. They just will never show up in the weight room if, they, if you don't force them or force them. Put them in during practice. So then that will never develop too. So you have to develop a time during practice or have a time in the mornings. I know Cannon Falls, Scott does. They come in, all their athletes come in at 6 a.m. They do their speed program, they lift, and they're done by 7 o'clock or 7.30. And they all go to school. And then after school, there's nothing. There's sport practice. So those are the practical things that you can get out of this. So now I'm going to go on to the speed workout that we do. I don't do it as much. Carl does a lot of it. Brent kind of does a lot of it. Um, we kind of, I know Dale Basquet, sat with him. He's taught me in 2006, 2007 when he came, 2008 when we came, and then I've been to some clinics with him demonstrating for him. The biggest thing that he sees at all this, you know, wherever he goes, is a lot of people are doing this when they run. Playing the bongos, chopping lettuce, okay? He's all about here, lock it in at 90 and rotation. This controls this. Then after that, once you get that down here, then you gotta synchronize your leg to your arm. Your legs can go 100 miles an hour, but your arms are moving slow, that doesn't work. The faster your shoulder moves and this rotation, the faster your legs will go. Okay, you playing the bongos, your legs are doing a whole bunch of other different things. They don't know where the hell it's going. Okay, so you get that down. If you listen to where you're in here with Brent, about that arm rotation. Okay, your legs follow your arms, not your arm, your legs follow. Your arms follow your legs, your legs don't follow your arms. So identify correct running form. Here's a little drawing that Dale Basquette did. So you got your line, your head, your torso, and your legs. You always want to keep that straight. Then your synchronization, lower limbs and upper limbs. Moving at the same time. <coughs> and then the strike of the run is slightly in front of your hips. Okay, when you're running. You slightly lean over and you're striking. Rotate. Okay? We always say football comes down to speed and angles, and that's what we're developing with our speed program. Here, two, break down, boom. See that you're slowed, you're stopped. When we do it, we want the extension plan here, boom. You're moving the other way. Okay, when you do it, you have that extension plant and go. Now here, break down and go back the other way. You're gonna get your ass beat every time, okay? 
So, four ways of developing a football speed is posi position specific running drills, which Brent covered with linebacker drills. We have many more other drills for different um, positions, like wide receivers. They all basically kind of do the same thing, it's just a little different tweakage. And we identify correct running form. So, we get our athletes in, we line them up in lines and basically go over the correct running form. They do different kind of drills for us to correct that. And we harp on them and harp. Olympic lifting, obviously that's going to develop your power. And your power is your speed, right? Speed is power. Research daily about football speed. Our big research, Brent covered too, uh, is Dale Basquette. He's our go-to guy. And he gets it. And develop, so like, there's, here's an example of kind of a cone drill that we do. So your 100 <laughs> sprint, then your lateral sprint. We threw the ladders out. We threw, uh, karaoke running, B skips, all that stuff because you're breaking a lot. When you're doing the uh, ladder drill, you're, you're breaking and your hands aren't moving in synchronization with your feet. Because you can do this, right? When are you going to do that on the football field? Never. Okay? So we, we incorporate the ladder run. So instead of karaoke, when are you going to do this? Never, right? Linebacker, sitting here. You're going to ladder run pretty quick and then turn off to speed, okay? So that's what big thing that Dale Basquiat talked to us about. So research on that stuff. Don't break. Some little recommended books that I did. Um, Olympic uh, weightlifting for sports. Greg Everett, he's a huge guy in mobility, stability, and Olympic lifting. Greg Everett, I like to read a lot about him. Great Cook, he helped write the USA Weightlifting program. So he knows a lot about <laughs> functional movement, a lot about Olympic lifting. The Supple Leopard is another thing that I use to help with athletes who are sore or who need to rehab a little bit or need to stretch a certain spot. That gives you good visuals of what to do with them. It's, it's stupid proof. You just look at the picture and do it and walk through it. Um, some diet, nutrition stuff I really push for my kids is a paleo diet for <coughs> athletes. So it's a modified paleo diet if you guys don't know what that is. All Pro Wisdom and Inside and Outside of Coaching are two great books that we have our coaches and athletes read. And Weight, uh, weight Training Program or Weightlifting Program is another one done by Bob Tiaco, I think is his name. And he does, he explains it more of the realm of competitive way that that's full on sports, but you do get a lot out of it for sports specific training. Basically that's all I got, kind of covered, you know, Olympic lifting. Here are the quotes that I've seen at nationals and at other sport coaches from um, Jeff Bernardi, some other big time strength coaches, Chris Doyle. Olympic weightlifters are the most powerful and explosive athletes in the world. Olympic lifting plays an integral role in training of all our athletes. No other exercise builds greater power than Olympic lifts. Any questions you guys have about anything? <coughs> yeah, how often do we lift uh, during football season? How long do we lift? How often. How often? Two days a week. And I developed a program to help. Uh, so it's not as much as of a load during that season, during that in-season training. Right. <laughs> one thing I'd like to say is one, one, one of the things that part of my learning process was we started with football, but you know we had four small schools, so you got you know, football is over now. Basketball wrestling start, and that's over. And now you got baseball and you got track. So one of the hardest things for me was how in the world are we going to? You know, we're going from football season, all these in seasons, and uh, you know, how are you going to incorporate all this? Because uh, you know, if <coughs> basketball goes, well, we we finally. Together, came up with a, 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 an in-season program that that we that had the basic core lifts. It is basically the same 
for all the sports. In other words, the, the core lifts that they do, like wrestlers like to do uh, some extra pulling stuff, but the core workout for in season is the same for the football players, basketball player, wrestlers, baseball. I mean, they're doing the <coughs> same lifts basically, except for a few other things that each of them like to add. And this goes all the way through. So by the time football season starts again, that kid who wrestled and then went out for track or whatever, we get in the off season, it's, it's all, it's I, like I try to, I call it my circle. You know, you want to keep that, if you can, you can complete that circle where you got, where, where you have all, all these three sport athletes <clears throat> and you can get the other coaches to buy in on it. That, that, that helped us really tremendously. I left that out. Uh, it was one of the things that, that uh, really helped our guys a lot was, was getting the other coaches to go along with that. And uh, so that's one thing you might want to consider. And uh, I guess one of the biggest things that I've learned, I used to go to a lot of these, these clinics and listen to these big time strength coaches talk and they lay out all these big, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we're, you know, we, we, we got 30, 45 minutes with these kids, you know, we, you know, you, you have to, you have to come up with something that works at your, I mean, our system might not work at your school. I mean, you bring your kids to our school, it would probably work, but I, I don't know, You're, you you may have, you know, a different situation. So you got to find that thing that fits, you know, I take all this stuff and, and, but I, I, I truly have to say that, and I, I believe this, that when we, when we, when we decided to go and, and implement the Olymp Olympic lifts into our program, I, I think that was where we turned the edge. It gave us that explosiveness that we needed to, with our smaller guys, to finally make it to where we wanted. I, I truly believe with all my heart. Now we do the other lifts. We do the back squat. We do deadlifts, and we do the bench, but we do the power lifts. They're great lifts. But when you add those explosive Olympic lifts in there, it kind of it, it really gives your kids a, an edge. So. Yes. How do you guys uh, handle your assessment process? What lists do you guys use? How often do you assess your athletes to see if they're making gains? Um, Etc. for in between sports. Okay. Um, After every football season, you know, win state championship. <laughs> doing pretty good. Not good. Got some work to do. To answer your question, you know, sorry, Ash, get busy. <laughs> what what lists and what events do you guys use to measure the the variables that you're looking for in regards to your training? Um. So to measure that, we usually we don't have the funding to test our vertical jump. We have a box jump mm -hmm. that we do, and we actually have a competition every Friday here and there. And all the kids get together and see who can jump the highest. Good. A lot of kids have been gaining quite a bit on that. And we also max out and one rep max and clean jerk, snatch, back squat, front squat, deadlifts, bench, and some other stuff too, to help to get that one to test our athletes. How often? How often? Every 12 weeks. What? What Scott Safe does when we do USA weightlifting, there's, they come in cycles every four weeks. What he does with his athletes, they test out every four weeks. So they remax kind of every four weeks if they're up to it. Otherwise, they can wait till that 12 week end. What's your opinion in regards to you guys say that you use the clean and jerk versus a, a power clean or a power clean type of complex or a, a hanging power clean? Um, I I use all all power stuff. I think if I'm gonna you know if I'm gonna teach any type of overhead push, then I'm going to do that separately with a push press versus, but um, I have not taken the USA uh, <coughs> weightlifting certification, so I'd kind of like to know your benefits of, of Yeah, the so they walk through, and USA weightlifting walks through of how to teach the clean, how to teach the jerk, and how to teach the snatch of ground up. So the power, as you guys, if you guys don't know, the power clean defined as USA weightlifting is from the ground here. That's a power clean. Okay. I want to develop my athletes more. What I use is the full clean. So here, boom, receive a load in low position, squat it up. And with that jerk, if you think of your lineman punching that guy, 
Okay? That jerk, you dip, punch it. Okay? We don't use that the old time. We used to have a jammer. We sold it to a kid. But uh, we used to have a jammer, so we... It takes a little time to teach your athletes this. You know, about a week or two to teach your athletes. It's doable. Oh, you know, I don't know how to teach the lifts. It's, it's hey, if I can do it, I'll tell you anybody. <laughs> learn how to teach this. Yeah. So we break down. We get our newbies in, and we walk them through, you know, teach them how to do the lifts, and then slowly incorporate that for about five weeks, teach them how to do it, and then we can get them on a program. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, well, I, I just, yes, uh, I think so. I'll, I'll touch a little bit more. Okay. Thank you. Another question? When you talk about the newbies, how old are they? Very young. Um, I have a... <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> Lewis, he's a second grader, third grader that comes in. What they do, they don't do any <coughs> loads, like a big heavy load. Our loads usually start around seventh grade, kind of. Depends on where they are, depends on where their flexibility and mobility is. What I do with the younger kids is a lot of body weight stuff, a lot of just with a PVC pipe or a, a little heavier bar, or not a heavier bar, a heavier PVC pipe with maybe sand in it or something in it, and I'll just teach them the lifts. They're going to match that to the T. Lewis has been coming in now, he's third grade about this, and he's the best Olympic lifter I've ever seen that came through our program. He poop, pops it up. Perfect form, very quick, very explosive. So when he gets that seventh grade range, He's going to be in that loading phase where he can start building muscle. I think that's about answers your question. So there's different stuff that we do. With our younger kids, we do a lot of the body weight stuff, and the older kids are more still the body weight stuff, but a lot of the core lifts. During the summer is when we build strength. So our, we have in-season basically all year, and then our summer is strength building. And we have a lot of kids that come in during the summer in the mornings and afternoons. You get a lot of support from administration. Uh, the reason why I say that is a lot of times it's difficult to get coaches all on the same page, especially right. in a larger school. Yep. When we start winning, people jump on the bandwagon. You ask me, all staff coaches sometimes it's really difficult. And athletic directors sometimes don't want to get involved with this. Mm -hmm. And then I know even curriculums, you know, I've like, been over to Caledonia yep. as far as running programs and part of FIAD mm -hmm. doing those things. A lot of schools don't believe that kind of stuff. I think you still do quite a bit of that. So the administration must give you quite a bit of support other than just the wins yeah. that you see on the board. From, from my experience, we've, they've always been bought in for the past five years. These guys will know how to, you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, right now I'm actually going through a time with uh, my daughters in fourth grade getting into the private school. You know, we got two private schools in Caledonia and then they all come to the high school. And you know, that's what I was talking about in the earlier session about the FIED programs and how it's hampering our kids. You know, your sons or daughters into, you know, it's, it's making them slow is what it is. And it's like my new pet peeve watching kids run on the basketball court driving me nuts because they're missing that juice that gets them to be, reach their full potential. And when you start teaching these kids this at an early age, it's just amazing how every single, you know, I think the key to our success really is we're taking a bad athlete you know, not picking up but a bad athlete and making them good. You get making the good athletes great, and then of course you got your superstars that are, you know, coming off the chart. Which, you know, who knows where they're going to come from. And as far as faculty, there's just people that are undertrained, but yet they're afraid to make the change, to listen, you know, to you know, a landscaper and a truck driver and a <laughs> pair is what we got in Caledonia. All right, we're we're no different than you know we're dumber than most guys in here. I know it. <laughs> so we just. Uh, that's kind of how we've done and changed and you got to get outside your realm and get your kids mainly to believe and it's amazing you watch the smiles on their face of them just being successful and uh, me as going into a school counselor that's what my goal is eventually is to to get kids to be successful as they possibly can be so I don't know if that answers answers your question I just wanted to add to Brent's uh, comment there um, being a graduate of Kelly High School it's both the culture of the community it's, you have to really, and I've been to various schools, you have to really change the culture, and Kelton only has a culture, has a prize of community. So it's, it's not much, people are aware of, like the athlete school, I mean, it's just about the culture. You have to find a change in culture there. It takes a while, it takes five years maybe, but the culture has a change in Kelton. For That's a very good point. We were not always that way. You know, I think back 2001, 2002, <laughs> we had, kids that we, you would have to run the alcohol out of them every single day. You know, we used to go and practice in each little town. One day, Freeburg's about 12 miles away. Kids were late for practice. You knew they were all misbehaving. 
Well, I drove the bus. We got going. It's like, get your butts going to Freeburg. You're running to Freeburg. They went about 12 miles away. I did <coughs> outside of town, but I did drive the bus past them as they were running, so they really thought they were running that far. But those are the things I think back to our past. It wasn't always that way. And right now, you know, I talked in that earlier session about that evil feeling. Me and Coach Frick were just talking about this the other day. That evil feeling you get in your school when you walk through that doors. If you've got that kid, you really got to focus on those kids doing the right thing. So many staff focus on those kids that are, you know, bad. And it would take so dang much energy to correct those kids. Don't forget to invest in those kids that are doing the right things. And I think the uh, finest one of the coaches back there talked to me. You know, how do I get that kid? Start with one. You know. I mean, I take our linebacker, Alex Gorgon, last year. He's a dude in there at 6 o'clock in the morning every day with me, first one in. The rest of the posse come in, you know, at 6.30. That kid, as a sophomore, he's a pretty special athlete, and he wanted it, you know. So there we are, 6 o'clock in the morning. He's going over those drills I did, discussed earlier. But that was one kid. All of a sudden, the rest are getting there five minutes earlier, five minutes earlier. All of a sudden, practice is starting at 6 o'clock, okay? As long as I can get my butt out of bed. But I'll sleep when I'm dead. Anything else? All good? Well, I thank you guys for your time. On behalf of the Cowboys and coaching staff, it's sure been a pleasure.